friends, and welcome to another episode of InfoVersity, coming to you live from the School of Information Studies at Syracuse University. Our guest today is Dane Dell. Hi, Dane. Hey, how are you doing? Director of Information Systems for the Onondaga County Public Library System. Dane oversees the Enterprise Library Information Systems for 32 libraries in Onondaga County. He holds a master's degree in information management and a PhD in information science and technology from Syracuse University. For his current role, he earned a bachelor's degree in information technology and psychology from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. He has taught technology courses here at the iSchool. Um, Dane's a firm believer that the digital divide is both a technological and social justice issue and is committed to enhancing computer literacy and providing equitable access to information and communication technologies in impoverished communities. Welcome, Dane. Thanks for having me. How so you? Uh, can we get started? Sure. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions to start. Um, you grew up in the Bronx. You love technology at a young age. What about technology did you like? And uh, did you ever imagine that you would be where you are today in a library? Uh, you know, I, I never saw myself in the library. Um, yeah, I, this funny thing is that I think li libraries in general, um, once I got past a certain age, I saw libraries as a place you go to when you're on campus or when you're at school and you go and study. Um, and I kind of forgot about the, um, the community aspect of it. And not until getting back into uh, libraries as, as a profession um, did I really uh, sort of regain that perspective of how important libraries are to communities. So um, I'm happy I'm here. Um, but I did always uh, think of myself as working in civil service and in government. And, mm -hmm. you know, our, our library system is part of our county government. So, um, you know, I, I feel like I landed in a, in a place where you know, I kind of wanted to be. So um, uh, technology growing up, I, I think, um, for me, meant being able to do things that I uh, it, in, a, in an easier way. So um, instead of, ha I remember having typewriters uh, yeah. and I remember how much better the experience was when we started using a computer, when I had an in-home computer. And I've always been able to go to um, houses of other family members or friends and use computers there, but never had it in my own home. So it was like, I was, you know, I was really happy when I was able to do that for myself and my family was able to kind of make, give me that, that opportunity. Um, but, you know, things like little things like printing, little things like, you know, making cards for, you know, my, my mom on Mother's Day. Yeah. Um, you know, little things like that. Being a, I, I really started appreciating the ability to do stuff like that, um, using computer programs and then accessing information over the Internet, um, communi communicating with friends over the Internet. Um, yeah. That, I mean, that was just, it was just all just very cool to me, so. That's the best part about computers is they're like a creative tool, right? Yeah. It's such a creative tool. Yeah, exactly. It makes it fun. It makes it interesting. Um, yeah, that's actually what I like most about them. People think I'm just like some weirdo that likes to code all the time, but it's like, <laughs> no, it's like I found it a, 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 a tremendously uh, creative outlet at times. It is. Yeah, yeah it, it, it is. It, you, you know, there's so much to do with, with computers. Um, once you have information, once you know what you're doing with it, it's like, you know, the possibilities are endless. So that, that's one of the coolest things about technology, I think. So uh, you work as a technology director and you are sort of like inward facing. You're not in front of patrons, right? So how do you feel like the work that you do impacts their lives? Yeah, um, I think something I think pride in one is that uh, the work myself my and um, our team um, that work in our department uh, do is, is that we make we hopefully make the work that librarians do um, a lot easier. So, you know, providing providing productivity tools, um, you know, in terms of the public facing stuff, um, the ability to access our catalog online, um, finding materials and things they want to read or research materials, um, the digital databases that we provide, um, all that stuff, all the information resources we can provide online. Um, and then also the access to the internet through our public access computers, through our Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. um, those are all ways that uh, I feel, you know, our, the work I do, the work our team does is able to kind of 
impact the positively impact the community. What do you think the biggest misconception is about your work? Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure what people think I do. <laughs> um, but maybe, maybe that's the misconception. Yeah. So like, what does he do? Exactly? Right. right. And, you know, maybe it's, it's not, not quite clear, but, um, for me, uh, in terms of what I do, I, I, you know, supervise the activities of our, of our IT operations mm -hmm. team, you know, goes from help desk support for, to, you know, um, database work with our, with our enterprise system. Uh, it's, it's looking for new opportunities to, uh, create new digital services, um, dealing with vendors, um, interacting with our county IT department, yeah. uh, you know, managing a federal, uh, reimbursement program, like, um, use, um, our, the e-rate program, which allows us to uh, to fund a lot of our um, broadband services, so um, it you know it's it it go it changes every day, and it's there's just different projects every day, but you know it's it's, it's fun. It's, it's always fun. interesting to try to take what you do and distill it into a sentence. And it's like, my mom still doesn't know what I do. Yeah, yeah. And I've, I've, been, I've been working for 20-something, 30-something years, and she has no idea what I do. Yeah, I think I think my family, they know I work in libraries. They know I work with technology, but they probably think I'm, I don't know, fixing computers all day or something. I don't <laughs> yeah, you probably get what I get. You go to Thanksgiving over a relative's house, and next right. thing you know, you're pulling, like uninstalling malware or something like that. Right? <laughs> exactly. Fixing a router. Or or fixing someone's phone. Right? Yeah, <laughs> fixing their phone, right? Yeah. Why doesn't my, my dad, why doesn't my phone turn on? It's right. like, because you need to power it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, speaking of, let's talk digital divide. Um, okay. um, what do you want people to know about the digital divide from your perspective? Um. The digital divide, you know, that's, that's a classic, like, haves, have-nots, um, the haves and have-not uh, story with, with when it comes to technology. Um, but really, in, I guess, more modern time, we talk about it in terms of digital inclusion. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, what everyone needs to remember, not just from, um, you know, we, we think about technology as consumers, right? We think about, you know, what's the, what's the next best app we're going to use. We think about social media. We think about, you know, all these things. And... If we're in education, in our education, we're trying to become, you know, developers. We're trying to become network administrators and this and that. You know, I think if we can all think about the fact that what we do is going to provide some sort of good or service to people, um, that there are those that, for a variety of reasons, are excluded from that, and that could be their socioeconomic background. That could be lack of um, lack of skills, lack of knowledge, um, lack of infrastructure um, yeah. in some areas, and so I think there are things that we take for granted as far as like who has access to what. Um, and so I think, you know, if we're if you're a developer, I want you to think more about you know, hey, is what I'm is is there a way that I can create this product in a way that people with different ability levels can still use it? Um, is there a way that I might be able to make different iterations of this product where I might be able to provide the same service at a tiered level where it's affordable for um, certain people who could take it, you know, take advantage of the product. Um, so, and I, and you can, you know, take that same schema across a lot of different, um, you know, portions of technology and, and still end up in the same, in the same place. Like there's some people who will want access and need access to this and may not even really realize um, how important it is to them. So it's, it's just a, I think it's a, it's a uh, composite of different components that, that can, you know, when you when you look at all of them as as a as a whole, it it all creates that digital inclusion um, discussion that we're that we're leaning into. I think you hit the nail on the head when you're talking about inclusivity as part of the digital divide. Many of us think of it in terms of like it's a physical, you know, I don't have internet access, but it really goes well beyond that. Yeah, um, and, and there, I love your perspective on there's many different facets of it, right? It could be that someone is building a system that isn't easy for another person to use versus just not having physical access to the 
networks or computers necessary, right? right. There's lots of different ways that you sort of need to think about it, right? Mm -hmm. So from your perspective, um, what specific steps are you taking to help bridge that gap? Um, I think it's the, it's the projects we, we do um, at the library. So um, for example, um, we have the hotspot lending program. Um, you know, these are projects that are kind of near and dear to my heart um, because it's, you know, when you when you see someone who, first of all, we 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 provide access to those who don't have it at home, right? So, yep. but we don't we're not open twenty four hours a day, right? So if you're not able to get to the library because you don't have a because your your work schedule doesn't allow it, and maybe you can't bring your child into into the library to take advantage of those um, computer resources or the, or the internet or the or the Wi-Fi available. Um, being able to take a computer device at home um, from the library, take it into your home, borrow it for up to three weeks, along with a hotspot that would support you know up to twelve devices. I mean that's a, a huge a huge deal, and yeah. I think a lot of people appreciate being able to use it um, and and to you know the things they could do with it, whether it's homework, whether it's applying for jobs. Or, um, or any other uh, communicating with family even. Um, we have a lot of, in our community, we have a lot of uh, refugees who, and we have a lot of um, people from all over the world who have family in places that, you know, they may or may not have direct connection with. So being able to provide like a communication platform is, is also a really neat thing. Yeah, I, I, can, I can see that for sure. Um, there's a, there's a, issue with this with the divide right and that it creates social injustices and can you talk a little bit about why why making internet affordable would be helpful to mitigate that you and i talked about this before we turned the mic on, right yeah yeah i mean it, it's the services that you get right so um you know someone who has uh you know really slow creepy service um you know, is not able to interact with some of the, you know, the programs um, available online that you might be able to with, you might, you might just give up doing certain things because, you know, a page is loading too slow or everything you type in is taking a million years to show up um, or, you know, things that you're trying to submit are, you know, it's just creeping and load. So the quality of service that you might be able to get is, is, you know, because of the different tiered services um, is, uh, is a problem. Um, and not being able to afford a certain level of internet or no internet at all, um, to be able to do some of those things is, is a problem. So I think that's where you get the affordable, affordable, it's not just affordable access, but, you know, being able to afford access that is like actual decent quality service is a, is a problem. So. And you, you look where things are trending. It's like, what can you do without a smartphone? Right. Um, you know, a lot of people might lean into the idea that so many people have smartphones, um, but that's, I mean, working in the library, you see that not everyone does. It's, uh -huh. it's not a, it's not a thing, but even if you do, there are certain things you can't do on a smartphone, right? Like you don't really want to write an essay on a smartphone, right? You don't want to, if you're doing some kind of, I mean, even some applications are not necessarily mobile friendly. So you don't want to, you know, it, it, but me personally, I, I prefer to do a lot of things mostly on my laptop because I, you know, you just get frustrated trying to, you know, fill in different forms on, you know, on your mobile devices, you know, it just makes it for, you can do it, but, you know, I mean, I think when you can spend less time doing it and get on to other things that you may need to do in your day and your night, people are busy, you know, people have, yeah. you know, I, I know having two kids, it's like, you know, if you, if you're going to go to work and then come home and have to spend time, you know, a whole lot of time because you, you're trying to get that next job and trying to take that next jump in your, um, in your economic status, uh, you know, it's wasting time with slow technology or, you know, ineffective technology. Just, it's just not what you want to do. You know? Yeah. There's so many facets to that. There's, you know, we, we talked about the infrastructure, right? We also talked about, you know, you, you and I both kind of agree that, you know, the internet should be available to everybody. You know, it, it could come to cost, but it needs to be affordable. 
Um, and then there's also the, the platforms, like do you have a laptop versus do you have a smartphone and what can you do on the smartphone, what can you do on the laptop? But then there's also the literacy side of it, right? Yeah. There's, uh, you know, you and I can probably take our hotspot, take our phone, turn it into a hotspot and get our laptop on the internet. Right. That's not for everybody. Right. Right. So there's like, there's many facets of, facets to this, right? Yes. Um, so that being said, what do you think are the biggest, like, what are the low hanging fruit and maybe like the biggest barriers that you have in this area? What's the easiest thing? And then what's like kind of the hardest thing? Yeah, it's, it's a constantly shifting, um, I guess you, you kind of you feel like you're chasing your tail a little bit sometimes because, you know, technology advancement is really good. But we think about devices, right? Um, as you grow into new advancements, uh, for example, let's, let's, let's use 5G, for example, like having a 5G network in theory is great. Um, do you have devices that can take advantage of that? I don't know. You, you may not, right? So there's that. So that's, that's like the device piece of it. And then let's say you do have it, but you don't know what to do with it. You don't know how to use it. You know, that's the, you know, that's the literacy piece of it. And then, you know, if you want to take it more back to the fundamental part of it, can you, this 5G is available. Okay. There's devices that support it. Can you afford any of those things? Yeah. So it's, you know, you're constantly chasing these things. And when you talk about barriers though, um, I think we've made a lot of improvement in terms of like getting the government, the federal government to be interested in this problem. And so we've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of grants come out, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, you know, huge investments. Um, I think the federal government in 2021 made a, like a over $2 billion investment into, um, digital inclusion initiatives. Um, uh, so, and we've been able to see local governments like Onondaga County, you know, um, the city of Syracuse take advantage by, you know, offering sort of more, um, you know, affordable broadband programs um, that would extend broadband into areas that don't have it or don't have affordable access to it. So, you know, I, I think those things are coming along, but we still have a huge problem when it comes to um, different populations being having the capacity to use these devices and literacy that, that comes with it. It makes a lot of sense. So um, what, what groups of people do you feel need the most help right now in terms of access? Is it, is it maybe age or another demographic that you see that is most impacted by this? probably a few to be honest yeah there's, there's <laughs> definitely you know and it's you know it, in each community you, you really want to do like a needs assessment yeah. um where you can really get get an idea of what it is your community needs so it's going to be different based on where you go but i mean in general yeah i think the aging population is definitely a vulnerable population um i mean and even locally we we hear a lot a lot of requests um by the um, the aging population that they would like more computer classes available, mm -hmm. like, you know, more, li I mean, they, some people might think, or some people, you know, some people are afraid to use new technologies or just don't want to be bothered with it at all. But there are, uh, there is a lot of interest there, right? Because it, I think a lot of people realize this is a way I, this is a way I can connect with my younger family members, or this is a way that I can do certain things and still participate in, in government, still participate in other community initiatives. Uh, so um, I think, I think you know, that's a, a, uh, that's a vulnerable population, but then also anyone who's considered to be low income is, is mm -hmm. definitely always gonna be a, a population to, to focus in on. Um, what, what is working well right now? Um, I think what I, what I mentioned before um, that the, the, the government, uh, the federal government is, is really taking notice and really um, putting a lot of investment towards digital inclusion initiatives. Um, and, and again, we, we're, you know, with things like Sy with the Syracuse Surge, mm -hmm. um, their Surge Link um, uh, broadband program, and then Onondaga County committing, working with uh, Verizon to extend broadband um, infrastructure into rural areas. Yeah. Um, though I think those are some some good strong examples of of things that are going right, uh, moving things in the right direction. 
I think 5G has a lot of potential. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's going to take a while. And I think I feel like the city of Syracuse with JMA being here might be a more early adopter of getting mm-hmm. more prevalent 5G into neighborhoods. Yeah. And I think that I think that there's there's some, maybe some good synergies there. I don't know what they have going on. Do you know anything that they may or may not be doing? Um, not not namely, but um, I, I do, and we, we did hear um, initiatives taking place, uh, especially on the city level, to um, to create the infrastructure that would allow um, you know the five G network to thrive in the community. Um, the library itself, we we have we actually um, are preparing to release new five G hotspots um, that are, would be available for for lending. Um, so that will allow you know people who don't have you know 5g phones or other devices to at least try to take advantage of, of that yeah i think of like my own neighborhood and there's a lot like if i look through the wi-fi in my neighborhood there's like an excessive saturation i don't know what your neighborhood is there's like an excessive saturation of wi-fi getting a lot of interference yeah and it seems like so wasteful and like you know there should be more of a community wi-fi where right. You know, we all pitch in, and yeah, we're saying we yeah. probably upset the service providers. <laughs> it's interesting you say that. Yeah, um, our, our 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 library network engineer uh, talks about that a lot at some of our libraries. Where you know, some of our libraries are posted in in communities where there's there are a lot of other competing um, devices. You know, trying to soak up that, that bandwidth, and yeah. um, you know, I. You tell me if you have a solution to that, but <laughs> the the um the community the community Wi-Fi uh, piece is is really interesting. I think I think um, more and more um, municipalities are looking into that. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems like it would be. I mean, I'm I from what I understand of Wi-Fi, it seems like it'd be fairly easy to to implement. Mm-hmm. There might be some weather oriented things that you might have to deal with right, um, right but other than that i mean it seems like you'd be able to put them on utility poles and things like that right yeah um, you're still going to have to deal with some wired routing here and there and that's going to work gateways or things like that this is where 5g might help a lot is you can easily have you can imagine a 5g gateway that you know is is using wi-fi right and then it it moves a Wi-Fi signal over to the 5G signal, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And then that yeah. could be a community Wi-Fi. Right. And that can yeah. just sit on a pole and be powered. Yeah, I think people would love that. You know, that, that, that would be a really interesting project. Yeah, I yeah. think people would love that. That's And that maybe moves things more into um, what we talk about, like the utility um, the utility piece of, of um, you know, having access to internet, you know? It's like electricity or just like you mentioned roads. Yeah. I mean, you, know, you need it. <laughs> Yeah, the big issue before that is someone's got to run the cable, someone's got to run the fiber, whatever it is, right? right? right. And if you can um, find a way around that, it does it does lower the barrier to entry quite a bit. Yeah, when you, you talk know? about barriers, I mean that's that's precisely it, right? One of the barriers was you know how do um, some of our big ISPs uh, reconcile with the idea of making services more affordable? Um, because because it's such an important need, um, you know. But they're in it for, you know, their own profits, right? Yeah. So, you know, those things don't always play well together. <laughs> <laughs> and none of that money you were talking about earlier goes to them. Right? Right. That's not exactly. the, how those programs work, right. Right? Exactly. Which is sort of where, like, if if government were more involved in the um, in the internet infrastructure, it would. Right? Yeah, and that's sort of where, like, you know, it's kind of like a toll road, right? Yes, exactly. It's like we don't privatize our toll roads, right? Um, it's the same idea. Yes, right? exactly. Right. Yeah, that's. Uh, it, I think. I think we, you know, probably more and more, you'll start to have those same kind of conversations when it comes to even things like like AI and, um, I mean, you know, we'll see where it goes, but. Yeah, I can see that yeah, right. in a lot of different things that um, are going to end up being sort of foundational to what we. To what we use yeah. every day, you know, right. as you and I were talking about, it's like you can't apply for a job right. without a computer mm-hmm. and the internet. You can yeah. certainly try to apply on a phone, but that's yeah. not going to go well. Yeah. Um, and so, like these certain like basic levels of rights to live, you know, um, are sort of like now part of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Yeah. We need food, shelter, water. Right. In many in many ways, we need we need access. Yeah, it's um, it's, it's a quality of life thing. You yeah. know, it's, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's not going to be, it's not going to, you, you hope it never becomes a point where it's like live or die, but no, 
but it, it certainly feels like quality of life um, is certainly impacted by that. Um, you know, I, I shared a story before about, you know, just something being, being able to uh, have a, a printer in my house, just kind of cut so much time off of my, uh, off of my schedule to, you know, be able to have access to that, you know, or, I mean, that's just one example, but, you know, not having to leave my house and go all the way to another location to do some research um, that would help me with my homework. I mean, that's, that's huge. Um, time is, time is money, but time is also, you know, such an important piece of, you know, what you do with your day and your, and your, and, and, your, um, and how you, how you live. So, um, and I think we need to do better as a society, just thinking about ways we ask people to use technology, especially in education. Um, you know, I've seen it with my own kids when they were younger and, you know, there's like an exercise that requires the use of a computer, but at home we had one computer and there's mm -hmm. two people that have to fight over that one computer. There's probably families that have three or four or right. five right. kids that need to fight over that one computer. Mm -hmm. um, I also had a, a story of my son where he had to do an activity where everybody in the class had to take out a smartphone and he was the only person in sixth grade that didn't have a smartphone. Oh, okay. now, he and two other people. Yeah. And he came home in tears and, you know, I was like, this is why you can't do those kinds of things, right? right, right. It does bring up a really good point, though, that we, you know, when we're designing things, we need to make sure that we think of everybody, right? right. Not just, well, most people are going to have a smartphone, right? Exactly. Because most isn't enough, right? Exactly, right. And you think about, um, you used to be able to, um, you know, call a cab or call a bus, and now everything's like moving, and like, you know, cabs are going away because of Uber and things like that. And it's like, mm -hmm. now, what, what are people that don't have a smartphone and they need to get rides? Right. No, those things are, those things are, um, we, we need to start thinking more about those things. Yeah. Be more yeah. mindful in the, in the types of um, technologies that we create. Right. For sure. Exactly. I mean, you know, even things like, you know, getting, getting alerts when there's, when there's some kind of disaster uh, that, yeah. that strike. I mean, you know, that's, that could be the difference between life and death for someone. Right. So yeah. having, um, being able to get those cellular uh, you know, sell your service <laughs> even is, is, is just like, it's important. Yeah. Things like that. So. Yeah. yeah. And like, you know, over the air TV and um, over the air radio, those are all, you know, they're still around, right. but they're not as prevalent as they once were. And it does raise a concerning effort is will we ever reach a point where the only way you can get anything is to first have internet access. And then that becomes, Right. A huge barrier. Yeah. To I, a I think, lot of people. Yeah. I think people do take that for granted. I think people do assume that everyone has it. And, yeah. You know, it's kind of a, it's, it's a pretty dangerous assumption. Well, well sorry to go off on the tangent, well, but it's, it's great, great to talk to you about these things. Yeah. Um, so you're from Jamaica, right? Yeah. You grew up in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. uh, how did your childhood shape your beliefs about technology and why technology is important? You know, I, I think when you when you don't have a resource, where you don't have access to a resource, um, <clears throat> other than being able to, let's say, go go to a library, um, and you see others that do, um, I think you you start to realize, like, oh, okay, like you know, you mentioned your son not being being the only one who didn't have that that smartphone. I mean, it's 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 not as that not, not as privileged as that. <laughs> oh yeah, that's yeah. yeah. You been given that smartphone, by the way. I felt really bad. It took another year before yeah, we got yeah, it, but right, we did right. get it. Well, um, and being blessed to be able to do that is, is oh yeah, that's a whole other right? that's a whole other thing, right? So, yeah. um, you know, I, but I think you know when you realize oh how much easier my life could be with certain things, it 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 sort of kind of puts that embeds that that principle in your head, like oh this is a, this is important and it's important to to uh, get people. Um, to start thinking about this uh, when it comes to, you know, the haves and have nots and, you know, those, those gaps that start to, to uh, grow as technology grows and it's in its different phases. So I have kids, you have two young kids, right? Yeah. So my kids are probably a lot older than you are. <laughs> but what, I, mean, I have a lot of questions, but like what, what role does the technology play in your kids' lives? Right. Mm -hmm. Let's start there and yeah. then I'll, I'll move on. From there. Well, right, right now they, <laughs> right now they know a lot about, you know, mobile devices. Um, 
particularly YouTube and, and Netflix and oh, of course, uh, you know, so the, they're, they're, they're favorites. Um, my, my daughter is two and uh, my son is five. And um, I mean, my daughter, she, she knows what she's doing on an iPad and, yeah. you know, my, my son, he, he knew very early what, what he was doing on an iPad. Um, so it, it's, uh, I, I lead them more towards the educational content. Um, and so for them, it is a way that they can sort of be entertained, but mm -hmm. it's also, I, I try to make sure that um, it's a way that they can, you know, get some education, a different format of education, something else that they're outside of what they're doing in school or in, or in daycare, or um, when they come to the library and play with, you know, all the different um, cool uh, uh, gadgets and, and, and toys that are available um, in the libraries, but it's, it's, it's just a, it's just a different piece. So they, I think they feel like, it, I don't think they even realize what they're doing when they're doing it. But yeah. for me, you know, I seeing adults who can't really interact with, with those devices in, in the, in the same way is like, it's, it's amazing to me to see how, how quickly they picked up on it. Yeah. I have, I have some theories on that, which I probably should read literature on. Yeah. But I mean, you know, it's one of those things where I, I see that yeah. as well with like mm -hmm. my older parents and, and then, then when my yeah. kids were growing up and you could give them a tablet and they'd right. figure out the tablet. Right? Right. 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 I think a lot of it is like somewhere along the line, we lose our inquisitiveness and we have an expectation for how something should work. Yeah. And we can't break the mold of this is how we think it should work. And it doesn't work that way. And we're just, we're just frustrated. I mean, you know? that same piece too is like, you know, some technologies you, you build them off of, you know, things that people already are familiar with, right? Yeah. So you would think as you get older and, you know, you start to see, you know, facets of that in the technology, maybe it will sort of the connections will be there. But these are, uh, these kids are, are you know, from, they've, they've got no body of knowledge to, yeah. to pull on. So they're just kind of like, they're just watching, observing, and then just mimicking and you know, they're doing successfully. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> experimenting too. They're like, they grab or they squeeze or they pull or they push and they say, oh, that's what that does. Right. right? right. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting when you think about it. Yeah. So what's your feeling on like, cause I got my kids started in technology kind of early. My, neither of my um, two sons are um, technologists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like they're like, dad, the Wi-Fi doesn't work. Fix the Wi-Fi. Right. You know? Like I wish they got more involved in it like that. They just didn't have an interest. They had other interests. Right. Right. Um, but how much do you allow your children to use technology to just sort of like, you know, you mentioned YouTube, right? So mm -hmm. you're letting your, your child, your children like go on YouTube, look at things on YouTube, you know, that's kind of how I was doing it too. I was blocking certain things, right, of course. Right. right. Um, but I, I was always a firm believer in letting them like sort of experiment a little bit and understand what their boundaries should be, you know, yes. rather than me imposing those boundaries. On right. Them. Right. Um, I'm just curious as to your take on um, consumption versus, you know, creativity, because you and I were talking about creativity earlier, right? Yeah. Um, I think, like, like what you do, I, I like to watch, I just like to watch them and see what they do and, um, and then put those boundaries in place where they need to be. Uh, but I find that they kind of, they know what they, they know what they like and they tend to stick in that, in that in that narrow space, mm -hmm. um, once in a while they might come across something that's different and that they find interesting. And that's a, that's a, a kind of a fascinating thing for me too, to watch and yeah. to see what, what becomes interesting to them. Um, but I, I like to watch as uh, like my son, he got to play like ABC mouse mm -hmm. in, in the library and, you know, seeing him interact with that and seeing him, you know, he was, I mean, for having not used a mouse before, he was, you know, surprisingly really good at it. And yeah. so um, it's just, it's just fun to watch them do that, that stuff. And um, I, I, I like, I like the creativity part. Uh, I leave, I guess I leave the creativity piece outside of that with, you know, with their blocks and with their. Yeah. Cause they're, of, they're so early in age right, right now. Yeah. Right. So they, they, I think they express their creativity in those ways, but um, I think, eventually they'll learn how to kind of blend them and that'll be interesting to watch too. Yeah. 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 Who knows what techn technology will be like in 10 years too. Right. Probably be able to do some really interesting um, creative, you know, creative things like with, 
easier 3D printing or more affordable 3D printing. Right, yeah. I'm sure, does the library have 3D printers? It does, yeah. yeah. Our, our makerspace um, yeah, has it's awesome. uh, 3D printers and you know, you could, there's makerspaces in a few different libraries throughout the county that have, that have them, yeah. So, so the big question is like, they're, they're so, so young. So how are you going at, how are you parenting in a way that fosters like, like healthy use of technology? Cause you know, it's like, you know, okay, your child discovers something on YouTube, but did they or did the algorithm just, you know, I mean. Right, what, you know, <laughs> this, is the, this is the part of it that I, I kind of, I find predatory because I think people who, who put these con this content together, they load them up with these ads and they load them up with these and my, you know, my daughter now, she's just like, she'll just click away. I think they know that, right? They yeah, it's that. amazing how quickly they pick up on, right. this is an ad. I don't want to watch this. Right. Skip it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really something. But I think on the other end, someone is loving it because they're like, oh, they keep clicking this ad. And, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so I kinda, I'm, I'm like, they did this on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, and they make these ads now that look like other cartoons. Oh, like, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. So, you know. They've been doing that for a long time because yeah. it's like probably my kids are probably like right. twelve. My youngest is probably twelve years old. I guess I'm, I'm just noticing now, just like because I'm like, why do you keep clicking on that? Yeah. <laughs> but I'm like, oh, it's because because it looks like another like cartoon or a cartoon you're familiar with that you want to you want to watch. But yeah. it's I don't know. But in terms of being healthy, I, I think you know it's just the common things you you know you try to limit. Um, how much time they're they're spending yeah. with it, um, and you know, making sure that they're still doing things like running around and you know, playing with other objects in in their vicinity, and not so much just always being on the the computer screen. But I, I'm I'm okay with them having some screen time, and I'm not you know, I know some parents don't allow any at all. Yeah, and, you know, that's fine too. But I, I kind of I like it as more of just like my technology background. I just like to see them interact with it and see what they do. Yeah, yeah. no, it makes a lot of sense. I was always the same way too. It's like um, get out there and do something, and you, you know how it is. You, you, you growing up, me growing up, it's like you don't have anything. So right. right, two sticks, and you end up having two hours right. with the phone with two sticks. Right. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's it, it really is. Um, you know, it's. It's fascinating the the journey when they grow up, especially when they're involved in technology. And you being a technologist, I think you're gonna love it. Yeah, it you is. love it. It's a, um, I used to experiment on my kids all the time. Like I'm gonna give them a little bit of access to this yeah. to see where this goes. Yeah. I'm like, well, that wasn't good. We're not doing that now. Yeah, I tried. I tried or, to or give them something like um, uh, an access, like really early access to like you know, I have like an old laptop, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I was like, all right, well, can they figure this out? Right. You know, with the eraser, remember that little yes. eraser thing? Yep. I had one of those old laptops. Yeah. Um, being a privilege and having an extra laptop kicking around, right? And it's like, you know, they're figuring out how to use that eraser, you know? And it's like, oh, this is good, yeah, because they got to learn different interactions. And, what I found my son likes is, is actually typing, um, just, you know, no, he knows how to write his name. And so yeah. he's like, oh, well, I know how to spell my name on the, with the keyboard. And I think he just likes to see that. He loves numbers. And so, you know, being able to kind of, you know, press those keys and see them come up on a just a notepad, I'm like, I've never spent extensive time on a notepad app yeah. <laughs> like this, but my I youngest used play. to do that. He used to just sit there and type things in notepad right? and then erase them and then yeah. type other things in notepad. Right. And he's just thought it was the coolest thing. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, this is why I wanted to get to this point. Cause I'm like, are my kids weird or are they normal? <laughs> right, who knows? It's, it's, it's good either way. Yeah. It's fun journey. And um, it's, it's, it's nice to be blessed and be able to give them things yeah. like internet access or, you know, you can use my iPad because if I break it, I can afford to get another iPad yeah. or something. Or, right. um, you know, that, that's always a, it's a different perspective on it. It is. Yeah. You know, it does, it does. Um, there is a challenge with technology and that is um, it doesn't age. Um, it ages very quickly. There's right. a lot of planned obsolescence in smartphones and things exactly. like that. And that's another thing that concerns me is like the affordability of this stuff right. for most people. It's like, um, you know, for a family of four, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when you have, you know, eventually your children are going to need their own phones. I mean, you're going to see it's just like it's ridiculous yeah, exactly. how expensive it gets. And it's like, um, you know, I get it. It cost somebody something but you know there have we have to decide um if there's a better way to do this yeah uh, because it isn't accessible for everyone it really and, isn't yeah and that's you know going back to my comment about you know 
technologists, uh, whether you're a software developer or you're on the hardware side, you know, thinking about how do we make these things still affordable for because every every technology has its own life cycle, right? So, yeah. you know, even if you were fortunate enough to get the access to the device at one point, you know, you, it it has its own lifespan. It will at some point need to be replaced, and you know. Now you're multiplying it by probably many, you know, two or three, if you have, you know, a couple other people in your household that need to use the device too. So how do you make it so that it's, you know, it's affordable to do so and replace them when they need to. So yeah. they're still usable. So it's, it's, you know, that's that, you know, cat chasing his tail thing again. <laughs> yeah. The one piece of technology in our household that has outlived all others is the Wii. Mm, mm. It's every I, summer I they my... whip that thing out and play play with the Wii. They get on there and do Smash Brothers and I don't know some other games. I have mine. I'm ready to to unreal. You know, plug unreal. it up and see. When, and my, see when, my, when my kids were little, they used to love playing bowling on that Wii. And oh yeah, you know, it's like it's still a thing. It's yeah, like yeah. Nintendo was like just genius with that. I'm, you know, unbelievable. I'm gonna, I'm get, I, I brought, I put, I pulled it out with all the intents to hook it up, and I still haven't done it. But I'm planning this summer to, oh, to, to, to bring it out. Yeah. If they haven't used it yet. <laughs> they haven't used it yet. I haven't no. seen it yet. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm patiently waiting for it. So, so that let's uh, let's conclude the talk with um, what is your favorite technology and why? Um, I'm. I, I guess I'd be in between video games yeah. and. Uh, I'm not, and I'm not a huge gamer, but I, you know, growing up, it was just a, you know, big part of my life. So Super Mario World and yeah. Mario Kart and Mortal Kombat and all these things. But then, you know, the games that end at some yeah, point, unlike the ones that my kids play. You know? <laughs> it's like I, don't, I don't know what kids are playing now, but I, <laughs> then I started getting into sports games, you yeah. know, Madden and oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey and all that stuff. Um, so, um, it, uh, other than that, I would say the the internet, like, yeah. and it, it's. There's a lot of fun to it, obviously. There's a huge entertainment factor. Um, but uh, I think just the access to information, if you're someone who likes to learn, um, and there's a lot of a lot of things to filter out, but you know, I think when you you know, when you know what you're looking for and you find what you're looking for and you know, you're able to kind of learn new things and be exposed to new things, you know, see places that you may not have been able to see uh, for yourself with your own eyes. Um, or be in a location. It, it's, I mean, it's it's just a. When you think about it, it's just a really cool thing. So I would say the internet. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Well, it was it was a pleasure, Dane. I appreciate it. And uh, this wraps up another Infoversity. Thank you very much. Thank you.